Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. This is Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council pasture walk in the winter for February 25th, 2021. Hey, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And because we can't hold our typical winter workshops of this winter, we decided it was a great opportunity to go out and visit with some producers and do some pasture walks with them just to show their winter feeding strategies and ideas. So for the next couple of weeks, uh, we're hoping to put out a video every two weeks of a different producer and, and how they manage the winter time. So this week, we visit with Mr. John McCarns up in Carroll County to take a look at how he manages his beef cow herd. So let's get started. All right, we're gonna start out with John's main cow herd. Um, this is a group of cows that is with their third calf and up uh, until he decides they're too old and time for them to leave the operation. Uh, remember John's uh, cow herd calves uh, in the fall. Uh, so it's a little different feeding strategy, a little different calving strategy. Um, this is one of three or four different groups we looked at that day. Um, one of them being the first and second calf cows, one of them the bulls and, and another group of heifers. So uh, as we go along here, you'll see him feeding in, in this herd, uh, but also just notice uh, that he's got a one strand fence around this particular area. He says he typically makes first and maybe second cutting hay on this field. And his strategy here is just to feed these cows when it's frozen or snow covered, preferably snow covered. Uh, just to put some fertility back in this field. Quick picture here at John's feeding rig. Um, of course, a John Deere tractor, but this was kind of a new piece of equipment for me. This is a Vermeer bale processor, and I, there are other companies that sell bale processors, but new to me, uh, but John can put bales in this machine, and then it tears it up and sort of chews up the hay just a little bit, and then puts it out in, in sort of windrow type fashion. So a lot like a bale unroller, only I would say better, it, it, A is chewing the hay up a little bit and putting it in a little tighter windrow uh, so that the cows can get around it. It's not such a wide swath like a bale unroller would be that the cows will tend to walk down. Uh, it's also self-loading so he can back up and hook and get a bale on it and then dump a bale in and we've got some pictures here coming up. But uh, not equipment that I think everybody needs, but for the amount of cows that John feeds and and he feels, in, in conversations I've had with John previously, I think he feels like the cows get a little better digestibility out of the hay because it goes through this machine and kind of processes up the hay. Here's John coming here behind us and he's gonna go through the gate. I offered to, to get the gate for John and he said, nah, that would spoil me if I had somebody to get the gate for me. But I, I did go ahead and, and hang it up and shut the gate for him. But he said it wouldn't really matter. The cows are going to follow him anyway when he goes in to put a bale in. And, and I find that to be true. But also, there's a fence behind us. There's another field. I'd shut the gates there, too, so if they get out to the next field, it's not that big a deal. Um, but John said he would typically just run over that gate. Um, but he has chains on the tractor today, and it would, it would catch the wire as he went over. It's a spring gate, so he could just run over it. You can see him kind of getting through the cows here, getting out ahead of them. And then right about now is when he's starting to turn that bale processor on. You can't really hear the, the motion of it going, but now you can start to see that windrow as the cows move away from him. But he's, he is putting hay down uh, out ahead of him. I guess this is an issue for a lot of farmers. They, they wonder how do you get in and out of the field? And I work with some of them on it, but in this case, John's got another fence behind him a ways back, but it's another paddock. If the cows get into that paddock, it's not that big a deal. He's right, most of the time they'll follow the tractor and the bail unroller anyway, so it's not really an issue. But in this instance, at, at other places, I've recommended guys build a polywire fence kind of to encircle the tractor and the bail processor. They can go into there, shut the gate behind them, open the gate in front of them and go in and then go in and, and unroll or bail process. And then when they come back out, it's just the reverse order. So if you're worried about getting in and out of gates with a bail unroller, this is a good example of how to make that happen. I mentioned this machine is self-loading and here you can kind of see um, he's got one bale in the chamber, sort of, so to speak, and, and one on the hook. Uh, and this in this way, he can, can carry two bales into one field at one time. Uh, so feed one bale or, or unwrap, unroll, process one bale, and then dump the second bale into the chamber and go ahead and feed it. And the video here coming up will show the 
the hooks coming down where he just dumped the second bale uh, into the chamber to go ahead and feed that second bale. John's now getting ready to start in with that second bale. You can see the forks coming down. I called them hooks in that last slide, but the forks that hold that second bale are coming down and they come back up into their transport position. And now he's rolling out that second windrow of hay. And you can see it's, it lays out a really nice windrow. Now that the cows are away from there, we can see how well it puts out a windrow of hay, just about like you would put in a baler. Notice too how John's trying to stay ahead of the cow all times and that's a safety issue but for anybody who, who doesn't unroll hay or or feed hay out in the field it, it's always good to stay out ahead of them uh, just so you don't have to worry about where one's going and where one's moving cows do some goofy things around the tractor and around moving parts so just a good idea to stay out ahead of them. in this video you can see that bale processor kind of working rolling that bale or tearing up that bale and, uh, when John puts that on there, he has no idea which way the bale is rolled. So it's not necessarily unrolling it, so to speak. It's just processing it, it's tearing it up and spitting out a nice windrow against that skirting. And this was rather long hay. And you can see how well it's kind of chewed it up and I put it out in a wood windrow. Um, it's a lot smaller particle size than it would have been coming directly off the bale. As compared to the previous videos, you can now see John's got the skirting lifted up on the side of the processor and that allows him to spread out hay further. Uh, you can even use it to, to bed areas with, bed pens with. A lot of the larger feedlots use it to, to bed with corn stalks or straw or low quality hay. So just a, a unique feature of this machine. It shows uh, the windrow and how the cows kind of gather around it. A good close up view. To kind of show we, we'd like it that the cows would stand with their feet out of the windrow but that isn't always the case they don't line up that way they kind of guard a spot for them to eat uh, but a, a good picture of, of how it kind of works and and how the cows feed from that windrow kind of a panoramic view here of the cows leaving that first bale that john spread out and going up to the second bale and that's because they're, they're just checking out which bale they want to eat first. And the second bale was a second crop had been wrapped bale, probably a little bit higher quality. And so they kind of stick with that second bale he spread out. But they'll eventually move back down and, and, and clean up that first crop bale once they've cleaned up the second crop bale. Because John's feeding two bales at a time, he kind of varies the kinds and, and types of hay that he out there so he, he puts out a first crop bale and a second crop bale at one particular feeding and and the cows will go and eat that higher quality stuff the stuff that they like better but they'll go back and, and clean up the the other stuff too and in this way it kind of balances their diet and john's got several different types of, of kinds of qualities of hay he's got some first cutting bales some second crop bale uh, some wrapped bales and he's even feeding some corn water bales uh, because he's got the the really good quality hay to balance all that out uh, and and that's okay it's it's by design uh, it's just a good way to to go ahead and feed cows and get a balanced diet to them John said that he probably is going to have to buy some hay and there's no shame in that either um, if, if we have to buy some hay I caution producers think about it as buying in fertility it makes the price of that hay a whole lot easier to swallow if we think about we're buying in nutrients for, for our farm and and in this way he's spreading this hay out on a field that he would make hay on in the future so it is it is a part of his fertility program at this point john's done feeding hay for this 12-hour period you can see a nice windrow cows all spread out nobody pushing or shoving everybody's got room to eat a really a good scene of unrolling or bale processing feeding hay now just to reiterate uh not every producer is going to need this type of equipment to be able to feed cows. Um, in John's operation, it works great. He's got a lot of cows to feed and, and he feels that he gets some benefit from that bale being processed. But, you know, we can get by with a $1,200 bale unroller. A lot of producers have picked up bale unrollers at auctions for even cheaper than that. And I know of operations that are two man crews that one drives a tractor and the other one sort of unrolls the bale with a pitchfork. And that works well for, for operations that aren't gonna be feeding one bale every day they can go out and unroll a small portion of the bale for their one day feeding period i even know operations that go out and unroll seven days worth of hay at a time 
into seven different paddocks and they rotate cows instead of moving hay every day with a tractor and, and feeding it out. And, and that system can work as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about rotation as we go along here today. But uh, just, just to know that not every operation is going to need a bale processor. Not every operation is going to need a bale unroller. It, it's all uh, needs to fit your operation and, and what your operation size and, and labor constraints can, can take as far as feeding hay in the wintertime. One thing I noticed, kind of an observation, as John was, was unrolling these bales, and, and I don't know whether he's noticed that and whether he does it on purpose or not, but I noticed that he, he fed in a circular kind of pattern. And that's kind of counter to how most of us would unroll hay. Most of us unrolled hay down the hills to start with, and so it unrolled in a straight line. And then when we unroll with a tractor, we tend to unroll in a straight line, much the same way as we would bale it up. Uh, but because he fed around in a circle, it kept the cows from walking down that line of hay uh, and, and stepping on it, tromping on the hay. Because he fed around in a circle, they walked the straightest distance between two points from where they currently were to where he was unrolling hay. And like I said, it kept them from walking on the hay and it kind of a light bulb went off. And in my mind, um, this is a problem, especially if you're unrolling hay and in just a little bit of a muddy condition, if, if that's what you have to do, um, they tend to walk that hay down and smash it in the mud. And it might make a difference if we're, we're rolling around in a circle and making those cows kind of walk shortest distance between two points from where they currently are to where the tractor is. You're kind of fooling them into walking off of the hay instead of walking right down along that path. Showing the residue left over after uh, we've unrolled hay or processed hay out there on the field. Um, just to show that we're, we're not ever going to get the cows to clean it all up and that's okay there, that's residue left in the field it's fertility left in the field and there's lots of manure mixed in among it but this is a good picture for what it's going to look like after they kind of clean up the hay and, and these cows have got that windrow there in, in the background that they're currently eating off of but just shows what was left over from the days previous and we'd like for it to be in straight lines and covering the field completely and getting every nook and cranny of the field but that's just not practical it's not efficient uh what we have to look at is we're, we're putting that fertility back out there in the field and and because of good grazing management that fertility will get moved now a lot of you are saying what about the water what's he using for water well this is the trough that he uses in this particular field and for this particular group john has a bunch of these uh Job floated tire troughs on a pressurized system, and it's pretty much what he uses for winter time, winter water. Now, I'm going to break one of my unwritten rules for doing these videos and say that there, there's over a hundred cows in this group, and the reason that's an unwritten rule is because I, I don't, I don't care how many cows you have. I don't like to talk about numbers. Uh, the principles that we course as far as grazing and watering goes, uh, they, they, they work whether it's five cows, ten cows, or five hundred cows. But in this instance, it's important to know that there are over 100 cows in this field, and that's what keeps that trough low. Now, it's got some slush on top, um, but because there's that many cows drinking, it keeps fresh, warm water coming up from the ground. It keeps that trough pretty well thawed. Now, John says some days it will get ice on it. He has to bust ice. He does have troughs other places with less cows on it that he does have to bust ice from time to time. Uh, because it's a Job float, we have to be concerned with the ice because if they ice over completely, the ice will pop the ball off of the string and it'll keep flowing. So there's some things that we have to do to protect that, that trough from the ice uh, if we're going to use a Job floated trough. I had to get one recent picture of John in there. Um, he, he's just checking around the outside of that trough and uh, John will go out and, and put bedding around the troughs if they get really icy around the outside edge. He'll even put salt around the outside edge of the trough just to make sure those cows aren't slipping and sliding on ice getting in their drink. If they're not drinking, they're not gaining weight. And, and, and in the wintertime, we may not be looking at them gaining weight, but they're also not getting the nutrients that they need that day if they're not taking any water. So he goes out and makes sure the surface around the outside of that trough is always clear. It's not be icy something the cows are going to slip on one other point about these troughs uh, i've seen producers that have covered them over to try to keep them for the reason i've seen producers that cover over the center and cut out like 
holes, teardrop size in, in the troughs. I've even seen them take pipe and put from the teardrop down to the bottom so warm water comes up that pipe. Um, there are lots of different ways to try to make these a little more frost proof. Um, John just chooses with this group. There's so many of them that it keeps the, the water flowing. Uh, but if you're interested in doing that kind of a trough, we can certainly work with you and, and figure out how to make it as freeze proof as possible. This is a, a trough that he's busted the ice on, um, but he, he puts the floats in in such a way that they're they're down close to the concrete at the bottom. There's a ball valve there so he can shut them off. And, and typically he has a culvert, half a culvert pipe covering over that valve, uh, both the ball, ball valve and the job float. And, and in the wintertime, if he's going to let a trough freeze, he'll tuck that ball and string up underneath of that culvert pipe uh, and shut the valve off so that the, the ice won't freeze the ball, won't break it, won't break the string. So just a, a good picture of the inner workings of the, the troughs that John puts in on pressurized water with a job float and a tire tank. This is the second group of, of cows that we went to that morning, and uh, this is the first and second calf cows or heifers, however you want to put it. Uh, but this, they're sorted in a separate group. There's around 20 in the group. I didn't even ask him how many was in there. But um, in, in this situation, he goes ahead and feeds them in a bale ring. The reason being because they, this group won't eat a bale of hay in a day, and I probably didn't go over that in the, the bale processing slides, but if we're going to unroll or, or feed with a bale processor, we really only want to feed them what they'll eat in one day or less. Uh, and this group of cows won't eat a round bale in a day every time. So it, it's just better to, for him to feed in a ring because they'll waste less hay. Just know that if we're feeding in a ring, then that increases that day count to about three or four. Um, it, it, we can put a bale in a ring and, and expect it to last three or four days, and that's okay. Anything over three or four days, then the cows are going to waste more of it. Now, there's some of you that say, well, I don't have that many cows to eat a bale of hay in, in a week or some, some, maybe even in a month. Uh, and that's okay. Just realize that you're going to have bigger losses uh, because the cows aren't cleaning up that three-day supply. Uh, if we're going to feed in a ring, we would really prefer it be three days or less, and then we'd be giving them more hay. And I know we try to set up systems that are seven days, and, and that's okay. We just have to understand that they are going to waste a little bit more hay. The other thing with, with bale rings, and we'll go into that, we, we just want to make sure we give them enough bale rings for the number of livestock that are out there. We don't want them to be too crowded uh, around that bale ring. So sometimes it's better to go ahead and give them two, uh, depending on how many animals you have. And just a little background on this picture, uh, he's rolling the bale down the snow there on the ground. And the reason for that is because that was that bale was sitting outside and that wrap was froze to the bale. And, and he's found, as I have, that it, it's easier to get that net wrap off if you kind of roll that bale over, get the snow off the top uh, and kind of break the ice loose around that net wrap. And you can kind of cut it and, and be able to get it off. The cows all kind of moved in around that ring and then pay attention to our little friend here down in the left of the picture uh, he was kind of following us around the field we're going to talk about him here. kind of caught this guy fluttering around as john was feeding cows and we saw some over with the other group as well too but this is an eastern meadowlark he's a grassland bird uh, that kind of hangs around and we, we've noticed them in our um, management intensive grazing type fields that before I was involved with management intensive grazing, I don't know that I'd ever seen an eastern eastern meadowlark. And I, I think that our management is kind of bringing these birds along and, and l allowing them to be there. And I just think it's a cool thing to, to point out because uh, of our management, we've got kind of these grassland birds that are hanging out and, and overwintering here. You know, we're at the, the upper portion of their, their year long range. Uh, so they, it's okay that they stay here. This is a common thing for them to stay here, but they're a, a sort of a threatened species because of the declining grasslands that we see in our parts of the world. For, for me, it's an indicator bird of, of a good grassland, that we're, we're managing our grasslands in such a way that the wildlife are enjoying it. They're ground nesters. Uh, this is one of the birds that we, the reason we talk about delayed harvest in hay and, and also on CRP ground, they prefer taller grasses. They nest in the grass. Uh, the, the young are, are hatched in those nests and and they actually leave the nest before they can fly and are tended to by the their their parents. So um, kind of a neat thing to look at. The, these are the birds, though, that are also, they're out there this time of year eating the seeds and things out of the hay. 
Uh, but in the summertime, they're, they're one of our beneficials because they're eating bugs. They're eating uh, larvae, fly larvae, probably some worm larvae uh, from the cattle or from the livestock. So a, a, a good thing to kind of point out and show uh, that our management is allowing these birds to, to be there and, and nest there and make our pastures their home. I know a lot of times we don't talk about wildlife or we don't think about the wildlife benefit. But there are benefits to both the wildlife and to us in having them out in our pastures. This is the water tank that those uh, first and second calf cows are, are drinking from. And you can see there's ice build up on it. But to point this out, um, John said he's got wire over top of this trough. And because there's wire over it, he doesn't have to put protection over the valve. You can see it down there in the water. And uh, he, I think he kind of felt like this was preferable to have that trough kind of split and have a wire over top of it uh, just because it doesn't, work, doesn't have to worry about the cows getting into that trough. But because there's lower cow numbers here, he does have to bust the ice. He does that, comes out and, and checks those daily, makes sure the ice doesn't get into the float. John's using these uh, liquid tanks. They're, they've got a supplemental liquid in them. Uh, and there's there's rolling wheels on the lids of those tanks that roll down in the liquid and the cows actually lick the product off of the wheels. But um, this is just part of his winter supplementation program uh, for his hay or for his forage. Uh, because he's a fall calving uh, operation, he, he knows that his hay quality needs to be a little better. And this is just one way to help get a little bit of supplementation out there for the hay. Now, these liquids come in all different formulations. Uh, as far as energy and protein, and they come even in not, no grain type uh, products, straight molasses. Uh, but this is just something he uses to help uh, boost the quality of the feed that those cows have available. This is showing him filling those tanks. He gets the product in totes or has it delivered bulk and they fill the totes. And then he takes the skid loader out and, and runs the hose down into the top of those tanks. And that's how they fill. Uh, I know that they, they it comes in lots of different ways. You can buy barrels of it. You can buy totes of it. You can buy it bulk and have them come fill totes or tanks uh, to be able to put into those those troughs. Uh, but just to show that this is how he gets them filled and, and realize that it's a very thick product for the most part. So it takes some time uh, to fill those tanks. But I, I found that it's it's kind of a, an easy way to get some supplementation out there to the cows if we need it, if our hay quality shows that we need that extra supplementation. These are John's heifers, and you can see the supplementation tank and then also the uh, mineral tub there in the foreground. Uh, he also said that the, these calves are, or these heifers are getting some corn screenings as well, but he's feeding them in a ring. You can see that in the picture there. Um, the interesting part about this picture, from where this is taken, we're standing right at the trough for this field, and, and you can see that hill slopes up. And, and John said when the snow came, he took the tractor and made paths from the bale feeder down to the water trough and to that supplementation tank and the mineral tank. Uh, and those calves will follow that path. And he said one word of caution is don't make that path straight up and down the hill. Make it at an angle because even after the snow is gone and years later, those cows will still follow that same path. You're, you're creating a path that they're gonna walk up and down. Uh, and, and John pointed out his mineral feeder, it's got a silt sock around the outside that he bought, and then he soaks that silt sock with a fly control in the summertime, and it's just a way to get fly control onto the cows. And again, uh, pressurized water for the heifers. Um, this one, because it really doesn't have a whole lot of animals on it, had a lot of ice on it that day. And John was showing us his preferred method for getting the ice out of there. He uses a round point shovel and kind of busts that ice up and shovels the ice out of it. You can see the pile behind the tire where the, the calves can't get to. Uh, because if you leave that ice in there, it'll just go ahead and freeze right back over. So you've got to remove some of those ice particles uh, to keep it from doing it. Now, John cautioned us, you got to be careful because you're leaning on that tire and got ice at your feet and you can end up dumping yourself into that trough and it makes for a long, cold ride home uh, if you do so. But um, just a maintenance thing. I mean, if this is the kind of trough you're going to use in the wintertime, you've got to be cautious about the ice and you've got to go out and bust ice both around the ball so that the float continues to work, but also for the cows 
to be able to get water. Everything is portable and, and this photo kind of shows, sums up uh, the different methods that John uses along with the rest of the pictures and videos we've had in this. But he uses these feeder wagons uh, if it gets muddy and he's got to put the cows either on a sacrifice lot or on the various heavy use pads he's got around the farm. Yeah, I think he actually has enough heavy use pad around that he can move everything to, to a heavy use pad if he needs to. But he's dealing with, with road crossings and, and timing and all those other things. And so sometimes he has to use a sacrifice area and use those bale wagons if, if he can or if he needs to on the heavy use pads. He, he, I guess it just shows that he's got varying ways to feed hay depending on what the weather is giving him. So if it's frozen, snow covered, it's a good time to process hay or unroll hay. Uh, if, if the cow herd is small enough, then he uses rings. If it's muddy and sloppy, then it's a good time to either go to a sacrifice area or go to a heavy use bed and be able to feed there. And, and I think that's an important point when we're feeding cattle. There, there's no one good way to feed cows in the wintertime. And, and he uses these varied approaches to be able to, to get the hay to them in the best way that they can to create the least amount of damage to his pasture areas. Yeah, everything is portable. And that brings up a, a good point. Um, John rotates the cows uh, among the fields uh, in the wintertime. Now, some, not all of them, just some of them, uh, but he rotates them around so that he makes sure that he adds nutrients back to those fields. And, and it's just a part of his fertility program. Uh, and, and many of us are, are doing that, you know, we're rotating around and, and I guess it, it takes some planning, it takes some thinking about, um, because we don't want to allow those, those livestock to, to sort of ruin every pasture field. Um, if we leave them there too long or let them overgraze those fields as they're eating hay, um, they'll, they'll graze the forage plants way too close and, and they'll have a hard time coming back in the spring. So we want to be very careful about the rotation that we do. And, and some folks rotate them more than others and, and go through more fields in the wintertime. Uh, some tend to just pick out one or two different fields and kind of feed in them and, and go on to a different set of fields the next year. It's all in, in what you want to do with your operation. I just caution uh, that if we're going to be out in the field, we need to make sure that uh, we're not going to ruin too many of them. We're not going to graze too many of them too close uh, and create uh, bare soil uh, in too many pasture fields. And so spring would be rough then because we wouldn't have the forage growth that we need to be able to graze the cattle once the grass starts growing again. Well, that's a wrap for this week's Pasture Walk. I want to take the time to thank my colleagues, um, Beth Krupsack and Kevin Swope. Beth takes all the pictures, does all the video, helps me out as far as remembering what I saw out there in the operation when we come back to put together a video. And we had Kevin riding along with us this week, and it was great to have in his insight and, and his uh, questions and, and comments to uh, Mr. McCarns' operation. He thought of some things that I wouldn't have thought of and asked some questions that I wouldn't have thought about asking. So we do appreciate it. After that, I want to thank Mr. John McCarns uh, for allowing us to come up and take some video and uh, spend time with him. And uh, he showed us around his operation all over the place. And I know that takes time and I know he's a busy man. So we do appreciate it. John is a great commercial cattleman and has integrated management intensive grazing in his operation. And that's no small feat. There's a lot of commercial cattle operations. Don't see the benefit in management intensive grazing. And uh, John has done that. And, and not only is that, but he, he is a great cheerleader for management intensive grazing, Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, and, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So we do appreciate the role he plays. Uh, we appreciate his ability to be able to ask questions, answer questions, uh, talk with other producers and, and and see other operations and and see how they fit in the beef cattle operation or in the cattle industry as a whole uh, and and know that what works for them may not work for him but that's okay it, it, they're all part of a larger whole when it comes to the cattle industry so thanks john we do appreciate it our plan is to put out another pasture walk here in about two weeks we'll be looking at uh, heavy use pads and some hay storage options and then we're going to do some more uh, as the weeks go on uh, with some stockpiled grass at some different operations. So be looking for those to come out. With that, I'll say we'll see you next time.